things that are supposed to be bringing those of us even who care enough about the wars to think that we're part of an anti-war movement to bring us together, and those coalitions don't really get along with each other. <laughs> um, so we in the peace movement uh, are not too sympathetic to other people in the peace movement. Uh, and I don't want to get in the weeds too much for those of you who are not that involved, but uh, suffice it to say there is a group called United for Peace and Justice that used to be very, very strong and active under the Bush years is not that strong anymore. So a new group came up called UNAC. Uh, and other people say, well, the UNAC is too radical. I don't want to be that radical. And then there's another coalition that formed called Win Without War. And other people say, well, they're too mainstream. They're too connected to the Democratic Party. So I don't want to be part of that. Um, so, and then there's the Syria issue that has really divided our movement as well. Um, so, uh, lots and lots of divisions within the peace movement. Um, there are the other movements that have just flourished since the time that uh, Trump came to the White House. And so we see from the women's movement, massive numbers of people out on the street. And this group called the Women's March continues to mobilize people. There are new groupings coming out of Bernie Sanders' uh, campaign called Our Revolution, a uh, brand new group called Indivisible. Raise your hand if you're part of a group like Our Revolution or Indivisible. So a lot of you are. Peoplepower.org. Peoplepower. Uh, ACLU is really good. They, they made so much money after Trump came in. They said, what are we going to do with all this money? We better start mobilizing people. So yeah. Um, now, if you go, when you go to those meetings, do you find the war issue uh, as part of the agenda? Not so much. Not so much. And usually not at all. And I know David complains about it all the time. I complain about it all the time. Um, we've got to do more than complaining about it, and, and we do, we try. Um, I think, David, uh, you want to explain what you did getting like 10,000 signatures for, um, yeah, the climate march? Yeah. As Medea knows, every time there's a big multi-issue coalition effort around everything good under the sun, like the, the latest, uh, maybe it's a people's platform, you know, but it's certain people and certain platform. Uh, war is left out, peace is left out. So the, the, the climate march, because they literally said they were including everything, and they were including things like gay rights and you know things that didn't obviously have to do with the climate. Uh, we said, you know, because militarism is the top destroyer of the climate by various measures, you know, 60 some percent of Superfund sites, top user of petroleum, number three polluter of US waterways, et cetera, uh, why not? have peace be an acceptable part of the climate march. Uh, and it took, you know, one-on-one -on -one communications, lobbying, persuading. It took a public petition and articles and media interviews and every form of pressure and badgering. And then even once they included it, they started like hiding it on a back page of the website. So it was a constant struggle uh, to get, you know, peace allowed in the climate march. Whereas if you go to a peace group, and you say, will you do something for the climate? Or will you do something for civil liberties groups that oppose torture but will never mention war? Or, you know, peace activists are always ready to join these coalitions, but these coalitions are never ready to include peace. And that's, you know, what we're up against. So I think, you know, we can discuss part of the reason why, because that might help us to change it, but I'll just throw out a couple of things. Um, one is a lot of these movements do have affiliation with Democratic Party, and Democratic Party is one of the two war parties. Uh, the, another is that a lot of these movements get union support. And within the unions, there are unions like the machinists that make the weapons of war, and they don't want to be criticizing war because it is jobs. Um, and so those are a couple of the reasons. I'm sure we could come up with a, a, with a number of more reasons, but the important thing is to push back against that. And I think uh, we have been trying to do it. For example, our revolution came up with this people's platform, and it does not include anything about the increase in the Pentagon budget that was already way too big that uh, Trump wants to increase by 54 billion and then members of Congress say 54 billion is not enough. We need more than that. 
So um, we are pushing uh, our revolution. We're asking for meetings with them. We're doing it through a variety of ways. But I think rather than just complaining, when you see this, even if it's in a local uh, grouping of indivisible whatever, pick up the phone, call them, ask them why the issue of uh, peace is not on the agenda, and insist that it be there. Um, another thing for us to discuss is who are the targets of the work that we're doing? You probably all get petitions constantly. We are all putting them out there. Uh, and I think that actually it's almost run its course, that it's sort of been petitioned out. Um, uh, but what is going to take its place and who do you target? And I think sometimes in terms of the petitioning, um, we get really tired of doing it to our Congress people. We get really tired of, of focusing on our Congress people. We have to focus on our Congress people because they make laws. Uh, and we should look at some of the, uh, the ways that we've been able to make some inroads in Congress. There was a bit of a discussion yesterday about the authorization for the use of military force. I think that's an interesting one to talk about. I, I'm very torn about it because if Congress did vote on a new authorization of the use of military force, they are not going to say, we're not going to give the president the right to wage war. They're going to say, oh, let's make it a little more restrictive. Let's make it have a time limit to it. So you know, do we want to get involved in that kind of thing? Um, we have been very involved in trying to push Congress to stop selling weapons to the most repressive country that you could think of that is spreading extremism all over the world, and that is Saudi Arabia. And um, uh, it is really quite remarkable when you just sit back and think, why the hell are we selling weapons to this incredibly misogynist, repressive, extremist, intolerant regime uh, and I guess it's because they have a lot of oil money and um, those who make the weapons want some of that oil money. So they have become the number one purchaser of US weapons. And to think that anybody in Congress could feel good about getting up in the morning and saying, I'm gonna vote for more weapons to Saudi Arabia or I'm not going to challenge the administration on these weapon sales um, is a sad, uh, uh, reflection on our system, but the fact of the matter is we cannot still get a majority of people in Congress to oppose even a portion of the weapons that are being sold to Saudi Arabia and now used in Yemen to commit war crimes. But we are pushing that and every time we push it, we get more of them. So the last time we did it in the Senate, we got close and that was 47 senators. So um, it's, it's important to keep doing it because they're the ones that can stop it. Um, one area where I think we can talk more about because it's a totally different um, dynamic is the dynamic around Israel-Palestine and the movement that is working on that because it has a lot of young people involved, it is diverse, um, it is facing enormous opposition among the biggest lobby group in the United States on foreign policy issues and that is APAC but it is making inroads. And one inroad that I want to mention is even though there's the craziest bill uh, in Congress to say that it would be absolutely illegal and you could go to jail if you wanted to use boycott, divestment, and sanctions against Israel. And all of these Congress people started signing on to it until the ACLU came up and said, what? This is called free speech. And groups like Jewish Voice for Peace, Muslim groups, they all started getting on the senators. A senator has taken her name off of that bill, and that is Kristen Gillibrand in New York. Never do you get a congressperson to take their name off of a bill. So that shows some, some, some movement. Uh, and lastly, I want to say it's important that we start looking at who really profits from the wars, and that is the weapons industry. And so we are starting a campaign that we're very excited about called Divest from the War Machine. And it's using the, um, the uh, positive um, gains that have been done around the fossil fuel industry to get into pension funds, city funds, university funds, and faith-based institutions. And when you have the Pope that comes out and say, if you don't come up against the, the arms industry, you are complicit. And, uh, then I think we should go to every Catholic institution and say, are you invested in the war machine? Um, so anybody interested, we are kicking it off with a 
a conference, a summit, a gathering in Washington, D.C., October 21st and 22nd. We will have people from different movements that have successfully done these divestment movements to learn from them and go back to our cities, to our faith-based institutions, our universities, etc., and say, get your money out of the war machine. Thank you. Right now, I'd like to give David an opportunity to respond to a couple of things that Medea said, and then maybe, Medea, you can uh, respond to David, and then we'll open it up to uh, discussion. So uh, formulate some questions here. Go well, ahead, David. I'm not really going to debate Medea, although I can disagree with everyone on Earth. Uh, Medea might be the, the most unlikely uh, <laughs> of all those human beings. Uh, but I, I wanted to say with regard to the people being on our side that we should be clear that they're on our side but they don't know anything. Uh, you poll people on how much of the budget goes to the military, they don't have a clue, not within trillions of dollars. Uh, you poll people on what wars are happening uh, and they don't have any idea. What nations is the U.S. bombing? Why is it bombing them? No idea whatsoever. Um, and so, but when you tell them, you know, when these pollsters at the University of Maryland sit people down and show them the budget and say, this is how much goes here, how much goes here, how much goes here, they all want to take tons of money out of the, not all, but the vast majority want to take money out of the military and put it into the environment and education and so forth. Uh, when you tell them what wars are happening, they want to end numerous of those wars. Um, and when I go and talk to a room like this, but it's actually the college students that attend this college, they know nothing about nothing, I'm sorry to say, but they're <laughs> eager to learn, and they're signing up to join the peace movement at the end of the event. And, you know, they're, 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 people are, are starving for information uh, and ready to use it, um, and on our side, inclined to be on our side. The younger they are, the more inclined they are to be on our side, because they haven't got their minds set in favor of war. But uh, they, have to be, they have to be given information. And I also want to mention that Code Pink and World Beyond War and other groups, uh, U.S. Peace Council, started working on, on resolutions uh, during this budget process and got a number of cities and then the U.S. Conference of Mayors to support various resolutions to the effect that rather than moving money from everything else to the military, which Trump has proposed, move money from the military to everything else. Uh, and... I, I wanted to mention this in contrast to what a number of other cities did at the behest of Democratic Party-led activists, which was simply to say, stop the cuts, stop the cuts, don't, don't keep cutting things, which persuaded various members of the public that Trump had proposed a smaller budget and was cutting stuff. And because they're for smaller budgets, just like I'm for a drastically smaller budget, although I'm for radical increases in everything people have heard of is in the budget, because they won't mention the existence of the military, they, they create this, this false debate between a big budget and a small budget where Trump proposed the exact same size budget. So, it, you know, so we, we, part of this process is shifting the conversation to things that aren't talked about, like what kind of spending, you know, not just how much. Um, uh, the one place where I will... Uh, respectfully disagree with Medea is on uh, petitions being useless. Um, having just mentioned how petitions were a tool in going after the climate march successfully <laughs> for what that's worth, uh, if you go to rootsaction.org and you click on the FAQ, you can find the lengthy list of successes uh, of which petitions have been at least one part, if not in many cases the only part uh, of those campaigns. So. Uh, by no means is it the best tool we've got or the only tool we've got, but I wouldn't, uh, you know, I wouldn't overlook it. Well, thank you, David. I thought we weren't debating, Medina. I can't, <laughs> I can't help it. I can't help it. So we, I agree with him. Petitions, yes, we put them yes, out every sir. week by Code Pink, so yes, please sir. sign up. I'm just saying they need to be part of a broader. Yes, campaign. I agree. I agree. No debating. So what do you say? Uh, yeah. Let's let's get it going both ways. One, one thing. Oh, absolutely. One thing is the silver lining in having Trump in there is that there are many people who didn't care about the wars that were being waged by Obama, who are now looking and saying, "Did you know that Trump is using drones? Um, <laughs> did you know that Trump wants to send more troops to Afghanistan?" So so people are kind of ready for 
opposing anything that Trump does. I'm glad you say that, Medea, because I expected a lot more of that than I've seen. Right. right. So we can we can open it up now and take a couple of questions in the back there. Okay. Um, one of the things, voice. <laughs> yes. So one of the things I think that would be helpful is more activity on social media, except it seems like it's not very well coordinated in a way of like um, uh, promotion of hashtags, for instance, that everybody can use so that you can get attention. Um, just more of the people who are in this room like actively participating on social media to, as um, Bob was saying yesterday, kind of be the, be the media around this topic. Um, so um, I'm wondering if y'all have any desire or uh, plans to coordinate efforts to promote specific hashtags, to have uh, coordinated efforts on Twitter and Facebook and those kinds of media where um, the voices can be much more present okay. in the national debate. Okay. That you. might be seen also by younger people. <laughs> right. David? Medea? Well, w one tool that's designed for that thing is called uh, Thunder, what is it, Thunderclap? Yeah. 